Well, good day, brothers, and welcome again to church officer training. This session is session four. We're going to be discussing the offices of the church. This uh, particular subject has uh, particular importance for me because it was the first area that I was convinced of in terms of biblical uh, Presbyterianism. And so when we look at the offices of the church, that's what we find in the New Testament is the office of a pastor, the office of a ruling elder, and the office of a deacon. And this week we're going to be looking at those three offices and how they function, how they are related and interrelated to one another. And so with that, let's go ahead and jump right into uh, to the topic. Now, Waters is very helpful here. I think this is one of his best chapters in describing how this works in the church and what the offices are. And he begins by giving us a, an overall understanding of what it means uh, to call this an office. Why do, we, why do we call these roles in the church an office? And he takes us to Ephesians chapter 4 in order to provide that explanation. And we read from Ephesians 4, 7 through 14. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean? But he also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He was descended is the one who has ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And then we come to the offices of the church. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness of deceitful schemes. What I want you to notice out of Ephesians chapter 4 is that Jesus Christ, when he descended and, and completed his work, he also ascended to heaven. And as he did, he gave gifts to men, Paul says. Now, what are those gifts that Jesus gave to men? What did he give to the church? Well, we are told on page 83 what some of those gifts were. They are apostles, they are prophets, they are evangelists, they are shepherds, and they are teachers. And so what we should take out of the, uh, the description and the, uh, the, the teaching concerning offices is, first of all, that they are gifts of Jesus Christ. And those who serve in these areas are meant to be gifts to the church. And if they serve well, they indeed are gifts to the church. Now, in understanding these offices, we look in Ephesians 4 and see that some of these offices are no longer, uh, are no longer recognized in the church. So why is it so? Why, for instance, in the Presbyterian church, are there no apostles? Why are there no prophets in, in the Presbyterian church? Well, here we go into the discussion of what we call extraordinary and ordinary offices. And so as we look at the, this distinction, it's important to consider that the church for a time carried on and conducted its business without a complete canon of Scripture. In other words, there were times in the church, of course, that 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and even, uh, even a complete gospel at times wasn't available to the local church. However, what was available to the local church were eyewitnesses of the work of Jesus Christ. We call those eyewitnesses apostles. And so we understand that, that the church had an extraordinary office in that the apostles had seen their eyewitnesses to the work of Jesus, and then there were prophets. There were men and women that were given the extraordinary ability to, to tell, uh, or forth tell, what God was going to do. And the reason for this is, again, because the scripture had not been completed. The canon was not closed. And so the Lord, through the means of men like apostles and prophets, was able to speak the word and speak the truth into the church. However, there came a time in which the canon was complete. We had a complete copy of God's word. And the church then must look to the complete infallible word for the truth. And so 
what we see in church history is because of a com we have a complete word, there's no longer need for the apostle or the prophet. But instead, we have ministries which sustain the, the work of the word. And so, um, Water says, in, in, in order to understand the New Testament teaching on office, it's important to understand that, that distinction between ordinary and extraordinary. And so, again, the, the completion of the scriptures mean that the apostles' work was finished and those peculiar gifts are no longer needed. But ordinary office is needed. We now have a complete word in the church very early on had a complete canon, a final word. There's no longer need for these other offices. And so Waters tells us that the ordinary, ordinary officers are those, the functions of which do not presuppose any special or peculiar circumstance of church life, but are indispensable in later ages. And those offices are the offices of elder or deacon and I would suggest to you a pastor, an elder, and a deacon. Now there is some discussion here of how many offices are there in the church. You'll notice that Waters, coming from the Presbyterian Church of America, an orthodox and fine denomination, uh, suggests that there are two offices, that of the elder and that of the deacon. But he also says that there are many uh, who see three offices and that, that this is an entirely orthodox uh, interpretation. In other words, we, we can agree to disagree on whether the church has two offices or whether the church has three offices. You should know for, uh, for your own sake, considering to, that, that you're in training to be an officer in the Bible Presbyterian Church, that we are, are a church that holds to three offices. You'll find a description of that in uh, your form of government that you've been given. But we recognize the office of a pastor, of an elder, and of a deacon. Other Presbyterian churches join us in that. For instance, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, of whom we have fraternal relations, recognizes three offices. Now that's not something that would keep our church from fellowshipping with other churches. It's not something that would even keep our denomination from having fraternal relations with another denomination. However, it does bear upon the ruling of the church and the church life and how we see different offices. You should know as we continue along in this chapter that there will be times in which it's important for you to know that we aren't a two office church, but we are a three office church and I will come back around to that later. However, we also ought to deal with, with a question here. Why aren't there bishops in the Presbyterian Church? After all, many other church denominations have bishops. We can think of the Methodist Church that has bishops. We can think of the Lutheran Church or, of course, the Roman Catholic Church. So why are there no bishops in the Presbyterian Church? Well, it's important to understand that the word that is used, bishop, is in Greek simply the term for an overseer. It is, in fact, used interchangeably with the same word that is used for elder. And so you think about Titus chapter 1, where Paul speaks to Titus and says to Titus, appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So he tells them, appoint presbyteros, appoint elders. Paul then proceeds to give Titus a list of qualifications for the office of presbyteros or elder. And he says in verse 7, for an overseer, episkopos, as God's steward must be above reproach. And so you see that these two terms are used interchangeably. The term for elder, episcopos, uh, I'm sorry, presbyteros, and the term for bishop which is episkopos. And so we see that there's no need to separate these as if they are different offices, but we see from the New Testament that they're both one and the same. Now I should note a practical consideration when churches do recognize the office of a bishop. Churches that recognize the office of a bishop recognize someone in the, in the church who is actually not connected in, in the local church the way an elder or a pastor is. Instead, a bishop is an overseer to other pastors. His role in churches and denominations that, that recognize a bishop 
is to oversee churches and to oversee pastors in those churches. And so what you have is an agenda that is not driven by the concerns and cares of the local church or the, the application and the carrying out of the reign of Christ in the local church. Instead, it's an office that is often disattached from the local church. And if you speak to those who have, have experience in those denominations, often what you'll find is there is an agenda that is a foreign agenda that is then inserted and pressed into the local bodies that often is in fact not welcome by those local bodies. And that is because the office of a bishop is separated from the local church and ultimately is an unbiblical office in terms of how it is often practiced. But now let's look at, at what the work of an elder is. Now, it's important to notice in our, in, in our book that we've been going through that Waters makes a distinction between elders. He, being a Presbyterian Church of America officer, says that he recognizes that there are two offices, that of elders and deacons. And, and again, we, we say that there's room for disagreement there. But notice how Waters describes the work of the elder. He does recognize that there are teaching elders and ruling elders. Well, what you and I would consider is that a pastor, in essence, is a teaching elder. And that the other elders on session are, in essence, ruling elders. Now, it's important to see this distinction, however. And you and I won't talk about this in terms of teaching elder or ruling elder. We simply would talk about it in terms of pastor and elders or pastor and ruling elders. And so what is the distinction and how do these work together? Well, here, here's one thing that you ought to understand is that m we may perform many of the very same tasks. For instance, I may uh, counsel folks in the church and, and I do spiritually. And so people will come to the pastor for counseling. However, and it might surprise you to know this, that the role of counseling ought to be done more so among the ruling elders of the church as they care spiritually for their, their flocks. Now again, it's entirely appropriate for the pastor to do that, but it's also entirely appropriate for the elder to do that as well. But there is a division of labor that we ought to recognize. The pastor or minister, as you know, is ordained by the presbytery and is a member of the presbytery and not the local church. And so the role of a minister is foremost that to be declarative, the preaching and teaching of the word of God. Now this makes sense because it's the minister who has the academic qualifications. He has been called, he has been ordained to that office to preach and teach and to administer the sacraments to the church. And so this is a distinct calling of the pastor. Now you'll notice that we have elders who teach and that is appropriate because an elder must be able to teach. However, ruling elders in the church will do other tasks as we consider the division of labor. For instance, it's these men who are trained and qualified and chosen by the church to minister to her distinct needs as a body. And so when we think about the division of labor, the, the minister even has tools that he will use in order to carry out his task and carry out his office well. For a Presbyterian minister, that foremost is the Word of God. The minister must know the Word of God, even knowing and being adept in the original languages, to be able to preach and teach the text well and appropriately. A ruling elder doesn't need those tasks. It's helpful if he has those tasks, or has those, uh, ha has those tools, rather. It's helpful if he has those tools, but he doesn't have to have those tools. But an elder will have those tools, and he will have the Westminster Confession of Faith, the larger and shorter catechisms, and it is important that the minister knows how to use those tools well. And he knows the tools in his toolboxes, and he knows when to use certain tools in order to address a certain situation. Now again, it's important for a ruling elder to have those, but it's not quite as important for a ruling elder to have them as it is for his pastor. 
Now a ruling elder has to have a different set of tools. A ruling elder, having been chosen from among the congregation, must know that congregation well. He must know his flock well. He must know the intricacies and the details of their life as he knows his Bible and can apply the Word of God, the confession, and the truths contained therein to the intricacies of the lives of those to whom he rules. And so that is the, the functional operation of these offices within uh, a Bible Presbyterian church, in particular Grace Bible Presbyterian church. And there's another question that we ought to take up, and that's the question of term eldership. Now, I should say that I agree wholeheartedly with what Waters says in the book. Waters is a proponent of not having term eldership, recognizing that scripturally there is no term for the office of an elder. If one is called as an elder internally and externally, then that man is an elder. And we ought not to put terms on his service. However, we, we as a Bible Presbyterian church, and again, especially here at Grace Bible Presbyterian Church, have a sort of halfway uh, agreement in how this functions. We realize and, and affirm that the call of an elder is not a call of merely a term. But we ordain a man to the office of elder, and that man will serve in that role until he, until he leaves us here on earth and sees Jesus, or until he leaves the uh, membership of Grace Bible Presbyterian Church. And so we recognize that the call of an elder and the ordination of an elder is that which, which is perpetual. However, we elect elders to serve a three-year term. And so, for instance, there are men who serve on the session who have served three years, and they put their name back in for renomination. At that point, the church typically will renominate that individual, and they will see no lapse in their active service on session. Now, a man may do that perpetually. He may be called and ordained and begin to serve on session, and he may, assuming that the church continues to, uh, to elect that individual to active service, he may continue to serve as an elder throughout the rest of his life. However, often elders will serve well for a three-year period and determine that perhaps it's time for family obligations or other obligations to step aside and to allow others to serve for another three-year period, and then they may step back in. Again, a common occurrence here. However, you should know if you are ordained as an elder, you are an elder in the Bible Presbyterian Church, and especially at Grace Bible Presbyterian Church, and you may always be elected to serve again on the session of Grace Bible Presbyterian Church. However, that is for a three-year period, which must be, again, revisited every three years of your service. And so, uh, having considered that, we, we now turn our attention to the office of the deacon. Now, where do we get the office of a deacon? Well, I would suggest to you that we get it in Acts chapter Six. In Acts chapter 6, the, the church is a blossoming body. Uh, wonderful things are happening. The church is being added to each day. And with the addition come problems. The problem here is that the widows who belong to the diaspora, in other words, widows, Jewish widows who have come into uh, Jerusalem but aren't from Jerusalem, are suffering need. They, they don't have... They don't have daily sustenance. They, they need the church to step up and support them. And the apostles see that we can't do this. We don't have time to do this. We've got to share the gospel. We've got to teach the word. And so they gather together the body, and the body chooses men to serve them. Now, the description is to serve tables. It's a, it's a different role than that of an elder. The role of an elder, <coughs> excuse me, the role of an elder is to rule. The role of a deacon is to serve. 
Now, this is not an office without dignity. In fact, the role of a deacon has tremendous importance in dignity. Again, think of Acts 6. What happens if there are no servants? If there are no servants, then the work of the gospel, the spread of the gospel, suffers tremendously. And so the role of a deacon is to serve in such a way as to help maintain the ministry of the gospel in the church. And additionally, the role of a deacon is to give a display of the care of Christ for the body of Christ. It's important that we recognize, and I'm glad that Waters points this out, is that the role of a deacon isn't merely practical. But as it is practical, it is a spiritual task. He notes the following. The office of a deacon is a spiritual office. We see in Acts 6 and again in 1 Timothy 3 that deacons must be spiritually gifted to undertake the duties and responsibilities of this office. Deacons handle money, assist the poor and needy within the church. Scripture reminds us that this is a task that requires the special gifting of a man in the Holy Spirit. The church needs to be sure men who are practical and wise in temporal affairs. The church, however, must see to it that these men demonstrate the sort of wisdom and practicality that accompany and manifest mature godliness. Well, brothers, I, I don't have time at this point to share with you how critical that is that a deacon called and elected by the church to be a man who sees his role, yes, as being among the practical cares and considerations of the church, but, but that he also sees that these things have tremendous spiritual import and importance. Secondly, we see that, that Waters says the work of a deacon is a spiritual task. It's not merely a spiritual office, it's a spiritual task. The work, with, work with the, that the deacons are called to is not a new work. It's a work that has been going on since the day of Pentecost. The assistance of those in the church who were in need is an expression of the fellowship of the church. Just as believers continued with, in one accord, in one accord, through fellowship, the apostles' teaching and breaking of the bread and prayers, they're also commanded to give, give as the body of Christ to those things that are called the outward things in the text. And so the deacon's calling is to assist the church in giving expression to the communion of the saints. It helps the church to do those things that, that the church is commanded to do to care for the poor among us, to not forget the widows and orphans among us. And so the role of a deacon is a critical and necessary task in the church. And it has practical importance in the church. The deacons are called to serve the church, not the world at large, though there may be things that the deacons desire to do among the world at large, but that is not the population that the deacons are called by God to serve. Deacons are called to serve the local body of the church. Finally, what is the response between these two bodies? The body of the deacons and the body of the elders. And what is the response or, or the uh, re relationship between the deacons and the pastor and the elders and the pastor? How do these relationships work? Well, here I'd like just to share with you how they work here because I think that will be most practical for you and helpful for you. The pastor, first of all, taking the office of a pastor, the pastor serves as moderator, as moderator of session, the moderator for the body of elders, and the moder moderator for the deacons. What this means is that the pastor, any pastor, by the way, either I or Pastor Casey, will serve as a, a moderator, moderating the discussion and, and guide the uh, appropriate bodies to do their work efficiently and well. And we also serve really in what amounts to an advisory capacity. Pastor Casey and I would often suggest a oh, course of action. But we always share that course of action with the understanding that deacons are called to do certain work in a certain way. And friends, I'm not a deacon, nor is Pastor Casey. And so though we may recommend a certain course of action, we understand that there are men called by God and the church who have gifts related to that area that must be respected. And so we try to do that as we moderate those meetings. Same is true for session. We will try to guide and lead the session of elders to a certain course of action, but we understand that those elders have a different function and role than we do. And so we do our best to try to moderate 
try to help and try uh, to inform the decisions that are made, but ultimately we know that we work together to make these decisions. So how do these two bodies, this body of the deacons and this body of elders, relate as far as things go at Grace Bible Presbyterian Church? Well, we have instituted, uh, a few years ago we instituted, having a deacon present at an elders meeting and an elder present at a deacons meeting. And we report the goings on of each body to one another. It's important to do that because communication is critical for the work of the church. The work of the deacons is often guided by the recommendation of the session. And the work of the session is often guided by the work and recommendation of the diaconate. We want to keep those two lines of communication open. Now, of course, we do that informally because we're brothers and we're friends and we talk about the work of the church with one another. But we also recognize a need to do that formally. And so we always want to have an elder present in a deacon's meeting representing the interests and the desires of the session as it pertains to the spiritual ministry of the church. Because we understand that many decisions that deacons make will impact the spiritual ministry of the church. Likewise, we always want a deacon present at session meetings so that the practical concerns of the church are considered as the spiritual uh, well-being of the church is being discussed because we understand that the spiritual well-being of the church must also include those temporal and practical concerns. And so I hope that gives you an insight into how those offices function in the church, Grace Bible Presbyterian Church. <clears throat> if I might just take a minute to address the remainder of our chapter. The remainder of our chapter concerns the role of women in the offices of the church. I want to dispatch with this rather quickly. Grace Bible Presbyterian Church and the Bible Presbyterian Church at large, including uh, our, our uh, documents, the standards, uh, the Westminster Standards, do not recognize the role of women in uh, ministerial offices. Now, there's a simple reason why this is so. <clears throat> we don't find that in the New Testament. The New Testament doesn't give us any indication that women are to be called to serve as a pastor, as an elder, or as a deacon. Now, let me quickly add this. I don't know what we would do as a church without the women of the church. The women of this church in particular are fantastic servants. And, and gentlemen, they get things done well. But they also get things done in a godly manner, respecting the authority of the offices of the church and understanding that God has decreed that his church be set up with male leadership. Now, there's not enough time to discuss why this is so. I would encourage you to read Waters' book. But understand that because we don't have women in, in uh, ministerial offices of, of the church, doesn't mean that we don't consider women important and valuable in the ministry of the church. But it does mean that we seek to humbly serve the Lord according to His Word and His Word alone. So brothers, I hope this has been helpful to you, and I look forward to our, our discussion on the offices of the church. Thank you.